We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Dear participants, it's uh, my great pleasure and honor to welcome you at the uh, United Nations IJF session uh, dedicated to restoring the natural ecosystems uh, that we have a great pleasure to co-host, we, Microsoft Poland, have great pleasure to co-host with uh, UNEP Grid Warsaw office. Uh, my name is Veronika Kuna and I'm the co-organizer of the event uh, today. Uh, the session is hosted uh, online, unfortunately, and we are not able to meet uh, in Katowice, but it's uh, great to see you, uh, to see the participants here online with us. So um, I think I will pass the floor to Maria, who is our moderator today. And uh, she also is a director of our UNEP Group Orso office. So Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Veronica. Uh, I'm happy that uh, we finally, uh, so we, that we can meet today. And I, this is my great pleasure really to open our session at this uh, very important event, United Nations Internet Governance Forum. And uh, I'm very open, uh, I'm very honored to moderate this session. I do hope that we'll, all our participants will join us during uh, just uh, in few seconds because we are still missing some of them. Um, so thank you very much for your presence. And uh, this is as Veronika said, this is quite unfortunate that we are meeting online only. <laughs> so we, it was, uh, we were supposed to be at this moment in Katowice and uh, share di directly our experiences as well as plans for future cooperations. But um, let's hope uh, the, the future for this type, uh, the moment for these type of meetings will come again. Um, this, um, this session uh, and presentation and discussion of, uh, is dedicated to the future relation or the relation between technology and nature protection. Um, all in relation to supporting the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, uh, which was proclaimed uh, uh, in the beginning of this year. And this is the decade uh, dedicated to the improvement of the state of the ecosystem, uh, which is central to achieving the sustainable development goals, not only the 14 F15, which are directly uh, about the, um, the, the nature, but also those related to poverty, health, combating the climate crisis and some others. We are looking for innovations, technological, but also social. social uh, but today, the, um, the advanced technologies, which are in our hands, are a very important part of the solution and should be integrated in plans for the upcoming UN decade. The goal of our meeting today is to present and discuss how uh, cloud computing and artificial intelligence uh, bring value to restoring and protecting natural ecosystems around the globe. So uh, we have only one hour. Uh, I really encourage you to ask questions on the chat or Q&A. We don't have Q&A, we have chat. So we'll try to answer some of the questions at the end of the meeting. Uh, because our time is very limited, so I'm asking Alexander Caldas to start with the introduction. Alex uh, is a chief of Big Data Branch in Science Division UN Environment Program. Uh, he's also a chair of UN Geospatial Network, a member of UN Data Governance Group, as well as a member of UN High Level Committee on Programs Strategic Foresight Network. Um, please welcome Alex Caldas. United Nations Environment Program. Alex. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. I think you can hear me um, yes. correctly. Uh, yes. Thank you so much. My, my first words are, are, are really uh, to be grateful and thank you for Grid uh, Warsaw. Thank you for Microsoft and the organizers for this important event. Um, let, me, let me share with you uh, three fundamental message 
on, on these UN decades uh, for ecosystem restoration. And, uh, uh, the, the, first, the first key message is um, it, it's not about technology. It, at the end of the day, it, it's about people. Uh, I, I used to the metaphor of the three Ps. It's about people, it, it's about places, and it's about planet. And, and, and if we look at uh, the, the, the times of change that we are witnessing, that we are key actors today, uh, it's all about how much impact we can have on people, on places and planet. What is the challenge here? The challenge is to come with an interdependent system that brings together people, places and planet. And, and I think th that's, that's the main critical challenge of the decade for ecosystem uh, uh, restoration. Uh, because we, we, we not when, uh, whenever we're addressing the impact on people, uh, so, um, such as reduction of poverty uh, or such as elimination of hunger, um, we, we're also addressing the tremendous impact on biodiversity systems and biodiversity loss and land degradation. And, and uh, of course, we, we, we're addressing the tremendous impact on climate change or on the availability of water. So, all comes together into this very dynamic system and this systemic perspective uh, that brings together, in fact, all the SDGs together. So basically, so whenever we, we tackle the, the challenge of the restoration of ecosystems, we, we are not only tackling nature, we're tackling the overall system of the so sustainable development goals, okay? And, and, and that I think is my first message is, uh, the challenge is much more uh, complex than we usually tend to put things together, okay? Uh, because we, 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 we face an interdependent, interconnected system uh, uh, that by the end, we'll be addressing people, places, and planet altogether. My second message is about the key question that you asked me to uh, about, uh, is technology in the picture? Uh, are we using enough of the technology leverage effect to uh, propel in this direction of addressing the challenges of people, place, and planet. Uh, well, I think we're very good in identification of the technology, uh, whether it is uh, big data, uh, it's cloud computing, uh, it's artificial intelligence. But when it comes together, or blockchain, when, when it comes to bring those technologies in these interdependent systems, we're not so good at uh, at um, at the effectiveness and and uh, and the impact that we really want to generate with it. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that we might be at the very uh, uh, at the very beginning of transformation, where we provide access to the technologies, uh, and and in providing access, we 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 achieving a certain level already, uh, and we we provide access. Uh, we still very much in the beginnings of the curve of the actual use of the technology, and, and we still have a long way to go when it comes to the, the actual value added that we can get from the technology uh, to get those systems in place, okay? So um, if I would grasp the, the current status is that we I would put it in, at the very early beginnings of uh, accessing technology. Uh, still very much at the beginning, uh, we, we have some good examples of the use of technology. We have much less examples of the actual impact of, of the technology uh, on the ground. Uh, that, that will be my, 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 my take when it comes to the actual extensive use of all of this together. But I, I have my third message is, is, is more about um, a, 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 a lasting P that I didn't put in the picture, uh, basically on people, places, and planet, with, which intermingles with the technology. And, and, and that message is about partnerships. Everyone is taking up partnerships as the holy grail of actually implementing things, uh, whether it is at the ground level, local level, or whether it is at the regional level of continents or uh, at the global level. And, and the partnerships, uh, are a fundamental ingredient, and, and these multi-stakeholder partnerships to address these problems are fundamental ingredient. My key uh, comment here is the following. Um, we 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 addressing the scale-up uh, of all our system through partnerships, but we need to address the, the question of the sustainability of the partnerships, okay? And, and um, most of our partnerships unfortunately have been very much based on projects 
and uh, they have a, a very short time frame or a short time scale, and and uh, let's say two to three years. Whereas the problems we are tackling uh, are uh, long term problems. We 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 have that example with the decade for uh, ecosystem restoration. So. When we try to set up partnerships with such a long time frame, we are facing a number of difficulties, a number of obstacles. And uh, I used to summarize these, these challenge by what's in it for me. So basically, if you find what's in it for me, for each one of the partners that are involved in these large scale partnerships, then you, you might come up with a more sustainable model. So the, which are the right incentives for the partners to be part of these long-term partnerships, okay? So what I'm trying to put uh, as a message in the picture is um, it, even if we find the right balance to have a clear goal of people, places, and planet, even if we are able to bring in the technology in a very nice way through the curve of diffusion from usage, from access first, then the usage, and then finally the value added of this technology, uh, we still have a big, a big challenge when it comes to the sustainability of the partnerships, okay? Because the, it, it is clear to me that most of these partnerships are very much targeting and oriented to the short term, to us project-based, initiative-based partnerships that last for three years, let's say maximum five years, whereas the, everything that we've been discussing is targeting the long term, is targeting decades, is targeting 10 years, 20 years, 30 years time, okay? So uh, I think we should all reflect and we have the ideal conditions, which is a wonderful uh, audience here in these forums. Uh, we have the ideal conditions to have multiple stakeholders involved to try to think the private sector, the public sector, international organizations, uh, uh, the cities and local based communities, how we can craft long-term sustainable partnerships. I think that's the holy grail because uh, when, when we go to long-term partnerships and sustainable partnerships, then we, we can get the time, enough time to get these uh, technologies on the ground and actually to go to the, our um, bottom line uh, uh, goal, which is to impact on people, place and planet. So I hope I have um, put on the table more challenge than answers. Uh, sorry about that. But that's uh, what it comes with experience on, on putting these things on the ground. Uh, and um, I hope we can have a nice, very nice and productive discussion. So over to you, Maria, over to you, Maria. Thank you. Okay, I'm muted, sorry. So thank you so much, Alex, for this uh, great introduction in, uh, yes, right, the partnership and the sustainability of partnerships, that uh, really uh, a challenging and that's, that's very important and that's a challenging. Uh, but we have some uh, experiences um, related to the grid network. So this is the partnership which uh, really works for, for more than 30 years. So that's possible and that can be successful for, for everyone. Uh, so the win-win solution. But um, yeah, and thanks for bringing these, those free people, uh, places, planet, um, uh, quite often when I'm talking about the climate crisis and all the challenges, I'm adding the purpose. So the fourth P, if in fact we can have uh, six P, but uh, let's also add the purpose because that's important that we do something really for purpose. And this is the, the uh, really what we need. So because um, the, our time is really very limited. So I um, uh, hope that we'll have time at the end to, um, uh, for some comments and questions to, to you directly, Alex. Um, but uh, let me uh, right now move to and invite Mr. Scott Mouveau, Mouveau, Mouveau sorry for the pronunciation, uh, from Microsoft to share us with a keynote which is titled AI for Earth Program, how are ecosystems restored and supported by technology. Scott is a director of AI and strategic partnership, Microsoft Philanthropies. Scott, floor is yours. Oh, great, thank you so much. And um, thank you for the, the Alexander for the uh, the opening comments. Uh, hopefully I can address some of the challenges you, you put out there. Um, should I share my desktop? I've got a presentation or is someone else going to advance through the slides? Which is which is better? Veronica, you have a... 
Can you reply? Are you sure? I can. I can share, Scott. Your I yeah, can or share. I can share too. That's fine. I'm happy sharing. Okay, so be... go ahead and share, and then then I will okay. do the next video. Share. Um, and uh, we. Um, do you see the uh, the presentation now? Yes. Yes. Perfect. So as hey, um, as Marie said, I'm I'm Scott Mauvais. I'm I'm in Microsoft Philanthropies. Um, I'm based out in San Francisco. Um, and I particularly run a program in philanthropies where we um addressing Alexander's comments on sort of the partnership side, where we try and partner with some of our our largest customers. Let me advance the slide here. There we go. Some of our largest customers really around that premise that um, the societal problems that we are looking to undertake are really larger than any one company, any one sector um, can, can take on. So here you've got um, sort of a list of some of the companies that we've worked with over the past couple of years. I just want to go through these quickly to sort of give a perspective of where I sit in the organization and some of the nonprofits we've partnered with. So, you know, I, a lot of the work I do is around skilling and getting people ready um, for the 21st century economy, but also um, part of the portfolio is around AI for good. It's a $125 million commitment, $160 million commitment um, from Microsoft, really in, in five key areas. I look after four. Um, AI for Earth, which is the one we'll, we'll talk about here, that um, looks at agriculture, biodiversity, climate, water, um, accessibility, um, AI for accessibility, really how do we um, make it easier for people with disabilities to engage um, in everyday life, how do we improve employment and education outcomes, how do we improve quality of life, AI for humanitarian action, which is largely focused around um, uh, disaster response, uh, rights, uh, human rights, particularly women and children, migration, um, and displaced people, and how do we we um, do a lot of work around optimizing resources for those populations? And then finally, AI for health. Um, the one that I, we also do that is just not part of my portfolio is um, AI for cultural heritage. So I want to um, talk a little bit about the premise behind um, uh, uh, AI for Earth. You know, we're we're facing extremely challenging um, circumstances these days. Uh, we need to manage and um, model climate change. We need to feed an increasing population while in reducing the impact on our ecosystems. And the complex interplay between these systems as we better try, as we try and understand them really makes it difficult to address them with, with, um, with traditional means. So that's really where our AI for Earth program comes in. And, you know, uh, in, in the, the premise of AI for Earth is how do we man, we sort of merge together the world of traditional environmental science and bring together computer science into that to help us better um, better um, uh, engage in these ecosystems. So the, the 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 premise around it is you know first how do we model these systems? We don't have a lot of data. There's really this sort of data desert uh, as we look at the complexity of, of the environment. We have um, lots of data on other parts, uh, you know, our economic data, our healthcare systems, but, you know, water flows and water basins, uh, biodiversity, there, there isn't the rich data set. So first, how do we monitor those systems so that we can get that data? Once we get that data, we can start to build models around them. And that modeling helps us understand at human scale what it is that we need to do to better manage and protect these ecosystems. And finally, it's, it's that management piece that, you know, it's that, that Alexander was talking about that we're not seeing a lot yet a lot of impact of technology in, in these environments. So how do we use AI to better, better um, prioritize our resources, help us um, optimize where we're gonna go engage for the, so that we can have the greatest impact. So um, in, I talked briefly um, in the AI for Earth program um, in the introduction piece about some of the, the areas that we're focusing on. And so I want to drill down a little bit into each one of them to talk about what, what we mean by them. So, you know, in agriculture, um, you know, we all need to eat, uh, but we need to do that at a lower impact of the environment. We need to find ways of being able to feed more and more people um, on less and less arable land. And to do that, we really can, AI can help us efficiently use our resources and monitor farms in real time so that we can increase that output. We can do it in a less impactful way. We can um, 
be able to do that with, with fewer pesticides, with fewer herbicides, and really help protect the environment around that. Water, um, you know, everything needs water. That's really the basis of life here. But we're seeing that the prediction for the demand for water over the next couple decades is going to um, far outstrip the available supply. So we need to find ways of to better model that, that water, those water resources, so we know where we need to protect them, where we can conserve them, and also how do we use that water that we do have more efficiently. Um, biodiversity, you know, the, there's long running decays of, of ecosystems around us that, that humans really are dependent upon. We don't, they have cascading effects when we start losing biodiversity. And we can use AI to better um, discover and monitor and protect that biodiversity. Once again, it's back to some of that, that data desert aspect um, and some of the examples that we'll give um, in the next part of the, the conversation where we'll dive into some of the examples. We'll really talk about what we're doing around species preservation. And lastly, there's, there's the climate change. We're seeing more and more extreme weather events. We are seeing um, uh, greater impacts to the quality of life. And so what we can do with, with AI is help people better manage, adapt, and uh, predict these, these climate changes so that we can respond in, in a quicker way. Um, so in terms of the AI for Earth program itself, there's really three pillars that we provide some grants around cash, um, uh, technology. So how do we get technology in the hands of practitioners, those earth scientists, those biological scientists, so they can use more, act more efficiently, more easily use um, artificial intelligence to, in, in, to optimize the, what they're doing already. Uh, we build tools around that. So we provide APIs, we provide applications that will help people um, uh, do their, their work more efficiently. So one example is camera traps. So one, we put camera traps to manage your biodiversity. Well, it catches thousands and thousands of images. Very few of them actually have anything in them. A lot of them are blank photos of the surrounding area. So simply using some AI where we can strip out the 98% of, of images that are empty so that scientists can focus only on the particular um, images that have something interesting in them is a huge boon to efficiency. Um, and then finally, the, in the data side. So in, in, in terms of data, we've made available about oh, 10 terabytes of data is now available to conservation actors. We've given grants to over 700 organizations, uh, uh, 700 glo um, organizations globally to help them increase their, their, their work. And in terms of making things easy to use, um, Alexander talked about that early on, so that we're early days of, 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 um, of um, using technology around um, environmental protection. We're building what we're calling a planetary computer. And the idea there is how do we, we marry together geospatial data and make it put it easily in the hands of practitioners. You know, right now, if you wanted to be doing um, advanced AI work, you, you really need to be an, an expert, not only in your domain of science research, but you actually have to be fairly technically literate in understanding how to build, uh, use machine learning models, how to manage clusters, how to clean your data. What we aspire to do is make that easier so that people can focus on, on, on their domain expertise. And so the, the areas that we're looking for the planetary computer to solve is really around classification, around forecasting, planning, and diagnostics. So some examples. Um, in classification, there's a lot of work. We do work around a land cover mapping. So how do we take satellite imagery and be able to understand what is water? What is a game trail? What is pavement? What is a building? What was that building potentially constructed out of by looking at the roof? Um, in forecasting, um, we've worked in Qatar to better understand the impacts of climate change and erosion on changing coastlines. Um, and we'll talk a little more a little later about some work that we've done in the Amazon around uh, predicting um, uh, deforestation. In the planning, it's really, you know, where do we go do this? And we have a project uh, with the Mos World Mosquito Foundation that is trying to control dengue fever by releasing um, um, uh, uh, mosquitoes that are unable to pass along dengue fever onto humans. And what they have built a model that understands the ecosystem of each area, the economic um, um, activity in that area, the population in that area, so that they can then go optimize where they release these mosquitoes. You have to do it, you know, roughly every 
I think it's every 50 meters or so, and being able to plot the neighborhoods where you're going to have the greatest impact uh, saves a bunch of time for the, the scientists that are going out and, and building these models. And finally, in, in the diagnostic side, um, we are doing some work um, that, you know, how do we, you know, how do we optimize that plan? We're doing some work um, with the World Oceans Foundation to, to attribute uh, greenhouse gases to the shipping industry so that we can better determine what routes we can use greener fuels, what ones are, what um, routes we can shift to battery power, which ones we can shift potentially to hydrogen down the road, which ones are long haul, and currently we don't have good alternatives other than, than um, fossil fuels. So how do we make sure we're optimizing the use of the fuel for the uh, the particular need. Um, and then also, um, I see Nick is on and he'll talk a little bit of work around ocean mine and um, better understanding the fishing industry. So um, we talk, talked a little bit about the 700 grants. Here's a, a, a quick map of, of where a lot of them have landed. Uh, we have, they're a fairly um, evenly distributed between our agriculture work, our biodiversity work, our water work, and finally our work around carbon and climate. Um, since I know this, this conference is, is happening in, in Poland, I think I would just pop up a, a list of the of the, the grantees in Europe, uh, being that these might um, be more some of these names might be more familiar to, to some of the, the folks that are uh, attending this session. And I think the next piece that we're going to go do is um, we have a project with CSIRO. We've done a number of projects as part of their um, um, uh, healthy country AI healthy country AI plan. Um, and one is around uh, protecting um, uh, turtle hatchlings. And I think that it's, it's uh, like two in the morning there for them or something. So that rather than participating um, certainly in person, but also even remotely, uh, they have uh, prepared a video for us. So Veronica, is that something that is on your side that someone there can play? Yes, I'm gonna share a screen now and Perfect. show you the video. I know The Healthy Country AI project in collaboration empowers Indigenous land and sea managers to rapidly survey large areas and interpret drone collected footage to show important changes to the ecosystem following on-ground management interventions. Hello, I'm Cathy Robinson, and I work at Australia's national science organisation, the CSIRO. I lead and support several initiatives that provide practical examples of how to accelerate innovation with ideas that value and enable diversity. This includes projects that focus on the ethical design and application of digital technology and AI for sustainability. Hello, I'm Justin Perry from the Northern Australia Indigenous Land and Sea Management Alliance, NAILSMA. We have worked with local Indigenous partners to co-design and use ethical AI and software application. These solutions enable data collection and analytical efforts to be governed by traditional owners, reflect the priority areas of concern for local Indigenous communities, respond to the seasonal aspects of Indigenous people's stewardship of their estates and support on-ground adaptive co-management efforts. Why? Because across the world, Indigenous people manage more than 80% of its vital ecosystems and threatened species. In Australia, about 4 million square kilometres of combined land and sea country are Indigenous titled lands. That's over half of Australia's total land area. Digital technology can help Indigenous rangers adaptively manage their lands, but it's critical that these tools are co-designed by traditional owners to ensure that they deliver benefit back to Indigenous communities. Our Healthy Country AI collaboration is helping to do just that. Over the past four years, 
the Healthy Country AI program has been empowering Indigenous land and sea managers to rapidly survey large areas and interpret drone, satellite or helicopter collected footage to show important changes to the ecosystem following on-ground management intervention. This responds to calls from Indigenous groups for ethical ways to design and apply innovative technologies to solve complex environmental management problems, specifically technology that can work with Indigenous people's stewardship practices and knowledge. In Kakadu National Park, Healthy Country AI has been used to rapidly assess the impact of reducing the spread of paragrass weeds on the abundance of magpie geese, a culturally important species on the Nada floodplain. With the data produced by ethical drone monitoring, rangers have used Healthy Country AI to get accurate estimates of magpie geese populations and of paragrass sites in Kakadu. This has enabled binning elders and Kakadu rangers to check how effective their management has been. The count of magpie geese in one wetland jumped from 50 to 1,800. In the Cape York region of northern Queensland, Healthy Country AI has accelerated the assessment of impacts of targeted feral pig control on sea turtle nesting sites. The Arkpornantan APN rangers are now able to efficiently analyse tens of thousands of images collected from helicopters to monitor predator disturbance of marine turtle nesting sites. This has helped them to target the management of feral pig populations and nest protection, leading to a 90% reduction in nest depredation. Healthy Country AI has also been harnessed to tap into data collected from satellites and tagged animals to manage large herds of cattle and buffalo using AI and space technology. Satellite GPS tracking tags have been attached to the animals and deliver real-time geographically accurate insights into herd density, accessibility and transport costs. Healthy Country AI is being used to help the rangers predict the movement of animals and the accessibility of their location, which informs important decisions about wild herd management. The Healthy Country AI program is freely available on GitHub. It's a great example of how Indigenous-led design of AI can be ethical and useful to Indigenous land managers who need to rapidly survey large tracts of their land. This is an end-to-end -end solution that supports an evidence-based approach to Indigenous-led adaptive management of important species and areas. Our efforts to scale up the impacts from the Healthy Country AI platform are now focusing on providing on-ground training so that Indigenous rangers can drive and develop AI and digital tools to not only support evidence-based decisions on their country, but also provide critical digital skills for future work on country. The process will facilitate increased collaboration between the creators of AI and digital tools and Indigenous end users. Ensuring the design of AI tools and use of data is supported through training courses that address gender and Indigenous specific ecosystem issues, systems and priorities. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to find out more, see the links or contact us on the emails provided. Okay, thank you, Scott, for your presentation, and thanks uh, to our Australian team for this marvelous uh, uh, video on uh, what's done within the Healthy Country AI supporting the Kakadu Rangers. And uh, the really in impressive results uh, of, their, of the cooperation and uh, the activities of the project uh, um, presented uh, in this story can be, um, can be an inspiration for others, for, for other communities. Um, the, for me, that's uh, very important that that's also about uh, supporting the uh, indigenous uh, people, but also about increasing of their digital skills. So that's, that's really important as well. Um, thank you so much. And then we move forward to the next presentation, a case study uh, prepared by uh, and to be presented by Nick Wise, CEO of uh, Ocean Mind. Um, with a title, I don't have the title. So um, Nick, floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'll just get the presentation up on the screen. Hopefully you can see that now. Yeah. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going, going to talk uh, a bit about the ocean. Uh, and uh, the work that we do in collaboration with Microsoft uh, and others in order to try and help protect that life in the ocean. 
Uh, you may not know, but over 80% of all life on Earth dwells in the ocean, and the ocean produces over half of the planet's oxygen. At least 3 billion people rely on the ocean for their food security, and one in eight people depend upon the sea to earn their livelihood. The ocean's crucial to our global carbon cycle. It shuttles gigatons of carbon every year between the atmosphere and plankton, and it's uh, important for regulating our weather and our climate. We need the ocean to survive. But the ocean is under dire threat from human activity and the relentless effects of climate change. UNESCO estimates that about 60% of the world's major marine ecosystems have been degraded or used unsustainably, and thousands of ocean species are threatened with extinction. OceanMind is a not-for-profit organisation with a mission to power enforcement and compliance to help protect the ocean's ability to provide for human well-being. Our work supports regulators of human activity on the ocean, providing them with training and support to increase their enforcement capacity. We also support regulated industries to understand their compliance and take action against non-compliance. So how does technology fit in and why is it so important? Because the ocean is big, it's really, really big, and regulating human activity on the ocean is incredibly hard. There's no fixed infrastructure, no way to see, no way to hear what's happening on the open ocean, except via satellites, which create a massive data set that is impossible to analyze and understand manually. This means that AI is required to sort and filter that data to highlight suspicious activity for investigation. Ocean regulation is also incredibly complex, with thousands of differing jurisdictions, overlapping and inconsistent regulations, and patchwork enforcement. Attempting to regulate human activity on the ocean without technology is impossible. But technology isn't just for regulators. It's also crucial to modern supply chains to understand the legality and method of capture for seafood. By using tracking data from fishing vessels and carrier vessels, it's possible to map supply chains, such as this example. This shows all the tuna delivered into Thai ports over the course of a year. By using the same underlying technology that regulators use, industry can make the approach, uh, approach the same problem of compliance and sustainability from opposite ends and make much more rapid progress together. Monitoring supply chains or enforcing regulated activities such as fishing is possible where this tra vessel tracking data is available and they identify locations and activities of vessels. But where regulations pertain to an area of the ocean, such as a marine protected area, it's necessary to use remote sensing to determine vessel presence in the absence of tracking data and determine if that protected area has been violated. By using satellite observations, such as synthetic aperture radar, it's possible to detect the presence of vessels from orbit. OceanMind has analyzed over 450 million square kilometers of satellite radar Im imagery, which is more than the entire surface of the ocean itself, to locate vessel presence. And that simply wouldn't be possible without machine learning algorithms to identify vessels within images. Electro-optical images can also show vessel activ activity. Uh, images from space can be low resolution or high resolution. This image shown is a relatively low resolution image from European Space Agency's Sentinel-2 satellites. But you can clearly see vessels with your own eye and you can see their wake patterns. And computer algorithms are being developed to detect these. This is a high resolution image. Here you can see a transshipment at sea in progress. This transshipment was identified using the vessel tracking data that we saw earlier. And then a satellite image was taken to capture the transshipment in progress. This is a high resolution image from Digital Globe at 50 centimeters resolution. But this was taken several years ago and it's now possible to get even higher resolution images. Even in this image, it's possible to see the refrigerated cargo vessel next to a typical longline vessel. The resolution is such that it's possible to make out identifying characteristics of the vessels, 
such as the deck layout and the number of cranes. And this is really important for enforcement. Another data source that can highlight vessel activity is visible light imaging. To illustrate this, this is a photograph that was taken from the International Space Station by Tim Peake, the UK astronaut. The green dots are fishing vessels attracting particular types of fish. Satellites routinely gather light source information, as with radar, and we can correlate these detections with vessel tracking data to identify vessels or locate non-transmitting vessels. To illustrate, every green dot on that previous image is a vessel a bit like this, where the lights are being used to attract fish from to the surface. And those lights can be seen from space. So OceanMind uses Microsoft Azure to securely and confidentially bring together all of these data sources to understand the compliance of human activity on the ocean. The scale of the data means that you have to use large scale computing resources, cloud resources and AI models in order to be able to understand them, to draw out the relevant information to support enforcement. In partnership with Microsoft, we've developed artificial intelligence models that identify specific types of phishing activity. Those are fed into our rules and regulations engine to automatically identify suspected non-compliance at scale. The AI accurately recognizes different phases of phishing, such as setting gear or soaking gear or retrieving it. And that means we can extrapolate more information from the data, such as how hard is a crew being worked and whether they're having sufficient rest periods. So all of this technology is then brought to bear to protect the ocean spaces and preserve marine biodiversity anywhere in the world. Vessel activities are mapped and compared to all the relevant rules and regulations, and they build a picture of compliance. And then intelligence can be provided to the regulators to power effective enforcement. Ocean health is critical to our continued survival and unsustainable human use of the oceans is driving dramatic decline, destruction of whole ecosystems and the extinction of thousands of species. But there is still hope. Technology is an enabler for planetary scale protection. By powering existing regulatory enforcement, it's possible to turn this de decline around and by the end of the decade, protect the health of the entire ocean for all of our benefits. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Nick. I'm truly impressed by your presentation. Really, this is like a dream to have access to such data and uh, to be able to use it to support the nature protection and, uh, well, the ocean protection and the biodiversity and to make so many other uh, activities. So, so that's great. Um, on the list of our presentation, we have also a case study uh, about Amazon, which uh, um, should be presented by um, Lucia Rodriguez, lead of Microsoft Philanthropies Brazil. But I'm afraid she was unable to join us. Okay, so I think Veronica has a video and I can talk a little bit about it too. So I think- okay, great. To now. Great, Scott. So floor is yours. But we have no sound. But well, I just goes with what we're doing here is we um, are using some, I'll wait for the sound, but we're waiting, we're using um, some satellite imagery to predict deforestation um, in the Amazon. And so historically we've done, uh, uh, we society has done a good job of building dashboards and reporting on it. But uh, this organization called Amazon ha has built a model where they, um, they look for um, uh, illegal roads new informal roads that are created because they are a precursor to, um, to uh, first uh, some clear cutting and then um, burning down of, of, of the forest in order to convert to agriculture. Um, so Veronica, do you want, are, are, should I just keep talking about it or do you want to see if we, you can get the video uh, audio going or do we just, or the captions enough and then we can just read the captions. It's possible the captions give us enough. Yeah, I think that 
because you are sharing or Veronica is sharing the video? Veronica is, I am not. Veronica. Okay, so. Can you be able, Scott, to say a few words about yeah, what we've yeah. done? After this, I'll, I'll show a quick demo of it. It's a public website. And then we can get on to the questions. I think this video runs a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. This is going, I will bring up the website. And we have Lucia with us. Very good. <laughs> yes. So, uh, Lucia, would you like to add something? You just joined us a second before. Yeah. Hi, but you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Unmute. Unmute. Oh. Okay. Can you hear us, Lucia? No. I don't uh, have sound. Okay, that's in a well, bit. I'll talk a little bit about it while she figures that out, and, um, and uh, you know, she can correct me anything when she gets down. As I was saying earlier, it's a historically um, the organizations have done a good job reporting after the fact uh, of of deforestation, building dashboard models, uh, which is very useful. Uh, but what we really want to help them do is take the next step and help um, uh, be proactive so that uh, local authorities ca can intervene. So similar to what Nick was talking about by understanding what fishing uh, vessels are doing um, and then feeding that information to interdiction authorities and then they can prioritize how to act. How do we go about the same thing um, around land use management? And as I had mentioned at the first part, oh, she has sound now. So I'm going to stop. Go, Lucia. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, no problem. We, we saw the video uh, provided by Scott, so uh, I think that we already understand what's uh, what's going on, what's the the um, what your project is focused on. So maybe we move to the discussion, and maybe during the discussion you can add some uh, uh, also additional. Um, uh, things if uh, there is a time, because I'm afraid that we are running out of time. It's five past uh, four in my place. Uh, and uh, we should finish the uh, session quarter past. So um, we have like less than 10 minutes for the discussion. So first of all, I have to say that I'm really impressed by all those presentation and how the technology can support and all the activities which Microsoft started some time ago. 
um, and how you are moving forward. So that, that's really uh, fantastic. And um, so maybe I will ask you, Alex, maybe you could comment because this is, you are looking from the UN perspective, fully UN perspective at what's going on here and what was presented. Well, I, I have to confess, I'm 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 so fascinated by the the demonstrations because yeah. um, from Scott and from Microsoft, I got this fantastic uh, slide on uh, how they're using artificial intelligence to classify information from the classification to the forecasting and then to actual uh, a demonstration of power on the ground. Then the the video explore uh, one thing that I think I, I forgot to mention uh, that. When, when I talk about people, place, and planet, the difficulty to, to bring in uh, local knowledge and indigenous communities into actually having action on the ground on doing that, it, this video demonstrates an actual application of doing that. The, the question that it comes out then to me is how to scale this up, because uh, at the same time, we want to have maximum impact on local communities and local knowledge, indigenous communities. Uh, how can we scale then this up to get a worldwide uh, scalability model for all of these things. But of course, it's impressive, the, 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 actual, the, the actual results on the ground. When, then when, when Nick demonstrated this, I, I, I really love it. I'm, I'm so marveled by, by what is possible to do with the oceans. Um, our lives depend on the oceans. Uh, I once had a chance to participate in an event that the, the exploration of oceans beyond the universe means not the universe, but our planet Earth is another big thing because water is still is there probably. But but while we do that, we have these immense exploration observation of the oceans, and we have seen that with with the, with the example of of, of Nick on the ground. So, so really, I, I'm so marveled that it is possible. These demonstrations uh, prove that it is possible. Then with the Carlos Sosa and, 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 um, and the colleagues, we, we could see uh, again on the ground how these things can, can be applied. So in terms of, uh, of uh, the United Nations, I think the contribution Anish can give to these is, is some kind of policy framework as well as the convening power to bring together different stakeholders. I think these are two areas of partnerships that the UN can do but well, but then leave to the, uh, the, the stakeholders on the ground, the companies like Microsoft and technology companies, leave to the actors on the ground, the actual doing and the action. So I think the United Nations can, can become a nicer policy advisor uh, and, and convening facilitator. Uh, but then when it comes to actually do it, we, we have the proof that the, 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 the actors here in this in these discussion are a good, uh, a good example of demonstration of power on actually implementing it. Over to you. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, well, uh, we, we are discussing uh, today that uh, this is so important to support the nature conservation because of the climate crisis, because of the biodiversity crisis. And uh, in fact, that's uh, invaluable for the hum hu uh, um, humanity, but it also has a strong economic value. So. Uh, which was also presented uh, in, uh, by the UN uh, decade on ecosystem restoration. So my next question goes to Scott. Um, what, what are the plans? And uh, so how would you summarize the results of what, what you did uh, by the end of the 2021? And what are the next steps? So what are your plans? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. I, I think it, it, it comes down to um, um, you know, Alexander, what he was talking about uh, of scaling, you know, so, you know, we are, we're a private sector company, we are a technology company. And so what we think we can contribute to this conversation is, you know, how do we prove out the technology? How do we make sure that it is, it, it is viable? How do we make sure that it's built ethically? How do we make sure we partner with the local stakeholders? Um, around that. And then, you know, once we can, we really look, look at ourselves as sort of reducing some of the, the risk, the riskiness of these scenarios. And then we can pass it off to civil society who uh, can then take that and scale around that. How do we build, you know, what we imagine, you know, success for us is where we're able to take a project, prove it out, and then hand it over to the private sector because maybe there's a business model behind it. We can hand it over to the public sector because so that they can take and scale that out 
uh, through, through, through their channels. And you know, we really look for those public-private partnerships. And where we see ourselves sitting is, is in that, that innovation space and, and, and funding nonprofits um, uh, such as Amazon, such as, as uh, Ocean Mind, um, working with state agencies such as CSIRO around uh, building these models. Thanks a lot, Scott. We have four minutes. <laughs> we were reminded by the facilitator that the time is really running out. So there was a question from the audience about the, uh, are there any uses of AI technology to support the bee population? And you promised to answer this question. Yeah, so I don't know. I'm sure there are. I don't, um, I'll let the other folks also chime in. I'll go quickly. I don't know of anything that's around protecting bees, but we do have a project on what is using bees to analyze the biodiversity um, in their environments. So we can, what we do is we essentially analyze the pollen um, uh, in bees as they come in and go out of the nest to help build a model that understands what the flowering species are there. And if you know that there are this many of this species, you know that then there are so many insects that feed upon that, then there's birds that feed upon those index insects, and we can build that, that biodiversity model on top of that. And they've also now, the organization's called Biodiversity. Biodiversity, but B up front, it's a, it's a French company. Um, and they have now, um, moved on to using that same pollen analysis to actually analyze not only the species of pollen, if species is the right choice of words, um, but also the chemical um, makeup of that to understand what the pollutions and the heavy metals are in that environment so that they can then uh, build a sort of not only the, the biological ecosystem, but also sort of a contamination model for lack of a better term to help prioritize resources. And so they talk about their, instead of the internet of things, they're building the um, internet of bees or the bee of internet uh, camera. So I should probably, they have a great phrase around that. I'll dig it up. Um, that, um, Lucia, I don't know if, 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 if you have anything that you want to sort of chime in the last couple of minutes since you didn't have a chance to sort of talk about your project. Um, no, I just wanted to, to, to add that um, to the risk of deforestation, we can add many other layers and uh, adding this to the what's next uh, and also to the B question. Uh, we can add several other layers such as uh, biodiversity, such as carbon, such as water. So we can also understand uh, crossing the risk of deforestation with other layers of information. What is the risk of carbon emissions? What is the risk of loss in moisture in the atmosphere? What is the risk of loss of bi biodiversity? So um, I guess that Previsa opens uh, a door to many other analyses that can be done uh, in, in the Amazon forest and other biomes as well. Um, thank you so much. I'm all the time I'm looking at the clock <laughs> because this is I'm afraid that they will just close the session and uh, don't even give us a chance to say a word for, uh, for, to, to say goodbye. So I think that uh, maybe that that's the moment when uh, I will share with you the message uh, Veronica has to uh, leave, but uh, we will prepare a summary and we'll share with you some key findings of this uh, discussion. And thank you so much for, uh, for your participation. I'm really impressed by all the presentation and I'm sure that there is a huge uh, potential for cooperation for everyone also at the global level, but also here at our, the, our country level. So uh, we'll keep in touch with everyone. Thank you very much, Alex, uh, Alexander Caldas, uh, you joined uh, this session. Thank you, Scott, for, for joining us. And um, I think that these are the last 30 seconds. So if everyone wants to, if someone wants to say uh, something, so that's the last moment, or if I'm not sure. I'm so afraid that they will just close <laughs> the <this> session. <laughs> so thank you once again. And uh, let's hope we'll meet in person yes. pretty soon. Yeah. Thank you all. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you.